Good morning. Um, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Derek. Uh, we had a couple of presenters drop out at the last minute, so um, I just threw this presentation together uh, over the last day or two. And um, I'm really interested. This is uh, an attempt at me to try and take uh, a concept that uh, I have a really difficult time like honing in on presentation topics. I tend to like take a topic and then blow it way out of proportion. Uh, so this is my attempt at taking a topic and trying to uh, build a simple example out of it, including some code samples, and see if I can uh, you know, focus in on this very specific topic and communicate it in a way that's easy to understand. So if you have any feedback afterwards, uh, I would love to hear uh, feedback from you. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Derek Lee. I work at Pivotal Labs here in Tokyo, and uh, I've been there for almost a year and a half, um, and I've been doing some iOS development uh, for, for a number of years now, Objective-C uh, in Swift. And uh, test, test driving, doing test driven development, and extreme programming, uh, things that we're doing at Pivotal Labs has become a big part of uh, the development work that I do. And so today's topic uh, is going to be about the date provider pattern. Um, and this is uh, what I think is a really interesting uh, solution for, for testing. And uh, so for some of you who've gotten into testing, maybe you've come across this already. Um, but I remember at the last meetup that we had here, there was a, a gentleman who spoke to me about like trying to, to write tests against uh, time uh, and dates. And so I thought this would be a good topic to, uh, to talk about for everybody. And so, um, like, whether we realize it or not, there's time and dates in everything in all of these apps that we're using. And uh, when I sat down to think about different use cases that use time, uh, there were just so many that I thought I'd pick a few of them to uh, show some examples of. So we've got calendar apps. We've all got calendar apps. And we use calendar apps and we schedule appointments and notifications uh, around those. Uh, To-do apps are a really popular app uh, style utility as well. Um, so we've generally got due dates and you know uh, different dates when you've created something. Lots of date and time around to-do tasks. Uh, transportation is one of my favorites. We use a lot of transportation apps all the time. I feel like I'm always on Google Maps trying to figure out how to get from one place to the next place in the most efficient way because there's you know 14 different train lines and I don't know which one can get me there uh, in the least amount of time or the least amount of transfers. Uh, airlines, buses, uh, since I, I moved to Tokyo recently, I've been taking the bus a lot. That's been a whole different type of transportation, subways, trains. Shopping is another one. Kickstarter, uh, eBay, Yahoo Auctions, uh, all these types of apps. They'll show you a countdown of how much time you have left until you can make your purchase or make your bid, whatever that might be, um, remaining time. And then even in my own app, uh, when I stopped to think about it, I built an app for practicing the drums that has some practice tracking features in there. And so even uh, my app for drumming has a lot to do with dates and times to track your practice session and how much time you're spent you spent practicing, uh, which exercises you've spent practicing. And then another one that uh, has gotten me a couple times is in-app purchases. Uh, my app uses a subscription-based, auto-renewal subscription-based service, uh, and there is an original purchase date, there's a purchase date, there's an expiration date, there's a cancellation date, there are all these dates and times, time zones, you know, time stamps that need to be dealt with, and uh, testing can be uh, a challenge with these. So from a business perspective, business perspective, user perspective, what I'd like to do is try and paint a picture of a user scenario. So I would like to take a vacation to Okinawa and I have a flight that's going to go from uh, Narita to Okinawa at 7 12 p.m. And uh, this is kind of my, my basic user scenario. I've booked a, a flight with this itinerary and I want to know how much time I have remaining before my flight departs. And uh, this could also be extended to include something like, you know, boarding times or pre-boarding times or um, check-in times, things of that nature. So in order to do this, we need to do some calculations based on the, the flight information that we have. Um, and so let's write some code to see how we might do that. I also tend to speak really fast when I get like nervous and I'm presenting, so I need to breathe and slow down. So here's a flight structure, 
and just basic information for us to, to work with a flight number, a departure city, a departure date time, an arrival city, and an arrival date time. I'm sure there's a lot more things we could stick in here, seat reservations and blah, 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 but uh, just to keep, keep focused on our example today, we're going we're gonna to work with this struct a little bit. And we can initialize it with uh, my flight data. So Japan Airlines, flight 925, uh, Haneda, oh, I switched to Haneda, Narita Haneda. Tokyo, it's all Tokyo. Um, departure date, uh, time interval since 1970, this is an epoch time. Uh, I've stuck the actual date and time off to the side uh, instead of pulling it out into a pretty constant due to size restrictions on the slide and just to keep things clean here. So we have a departure date time and an arrival date time and our departure and arrival city codes. And now um, we just need to calculate the remaining time before our departure. And this is going to be a method that returns a time interval, number of seconds, and we can grab the, the time interval for the departure time, and we can grab the time interval for the current date, so the date constructor give us the current date and time, and then we can just do uh, some math and subtraction, be easy, right? Um, add some formatting so that we can output this and see how much time we have left. Days, hours, minutes, and seconds. Simple method that just takes a time interval and spits out this information for us. And we can write some code. Okay, our time interval until departure is going to be our trip home. This is our, our instance of our struct uh, for the remaining time until the departure. Uh, that's the method that we just wrote to calculate this. It gives us that time interval. And we're going to format it and print it out. Time until departure, 25 days, 19 hours, 45 minutes, and 50 seconds. All right. Sweet. Done. Cool, right? Well, if you've seen my presentations before, you probably uh, can guess the next suggestion. We probably want to write tests for this. Um, and you know, we probably would want to write a test first for this, but sometimes it's hard to write the test first, right? If you, if you don't really, if you can't see you know, kind of the direction that you're going, sometimes it's hard to write that test first. So once we write a test for this and we learn how to test this code, then writing the test first in the future for anything that involves dates becomes that much easier. All right, so let's write a test. I'm just going to use XC test, um, no frameworks libraries, just some vanilla stuff. For this example, uh, test time remaining until departure returns correct time interval. So we're just going to give it some, some data here, our setup. We have our trip home. This is the same as the, the previous slide, initializing our instance and calling our method that we want to test. This is our, uh, this is the action step of our test on our trip home, on our struct. We want to get the time remaining until departure and pull that out into the remaining time. And then we just need to write an assertion on it. That this remaining time uh, cast to an int so we don't have to deal with any floating point precision is equal to something. And what what should that something be? Well, I just did some calculations and you know figured out what's the current epoch time and subtracted some seconds and came up with a number. And this number looks good. So I'm gonna run the test, run the test, because Xcode takes like 10 seconds to run a test. Way too long. And bam! Alright, assert equal failed. So the numbers don't match. Okay, well, whatever number Xcode output, it must be the number that I want, right? So I'm just going to copy that number from Xcode and, uh, you know, update the test and run it again. Okay, so here's our new number, and we're going to run the test again, and bam! All right, yeah, XTC assert failed. Well, yeah, this is, uh, hmm, this is uh, not really working in our favor, is it? So... We need to have a little bit more control over 
what's going on in this method. And in order to do that, let's take a look at our code and figure out what it is exactly that we need to, to gain a little bit more control over. So here's our method, back to our method, same method, time remaining until departure. Um, and if we, we take a look in here, the departure date time, obviously that's going to be given to us by maybe a flight API or, or something like that. You know, so we don't need more control over the departure date time. Uh, the calculation seems to be correct because we're able to run it and output exactly what we wanted to see. So if we take a look, really what we want more control over is the time, the actual, the current time, this date constructor initializer that gives us the current date and time. This is what we need to have more control over. So our logic depends on this one piece of information. So therefore, our dependency is the current time. This is our dependency for this for this method, and this is where you know test driving and writing tests is uh, connected. Because if we don't understand the dependencies that are inside whatever it is that we're calling, then it's hard for us to realize that we need control where we need to have control over these aspects. So now we understand we need more control over the current date and time, and this is our dependency. So how can we solve this problem? Drum roll, please. Oh, wait, that's my job. <laughs> um, so we are going to use a date provider. So uh, the date provider is a pattern. This is a pattern um, where we can ask an object to give us the current date and time. And a provider, uh, you know, uh, pattern can be generalized to say, like, it is an object that provides us something. It gives us something. Um, you could have all sorts of different kinds of providers. The kind of provider we need is one to tell us what the current date and time is. And so this, this is what we are going to do. Uh, we're going to jump back into our test and make some changes. And we're going to start from the test instead of from the implementation. So our dependency is going to be satisfied by this date provider. And we're going to modify our method to take a date provider as an argument. And this is one of, of three ways we can insert a dependency into our code, um, straight into the method. And we're going to use this uh, example for this case. Um, so our date provider needs to get passed into our method, because that's where we're going to use it to get that value. This changes the method declaration, right? So originally we didn't take any arguments in and we returned a time interval. Now we're going to take a date provider in and return that time interval. So this is a slight change to our definition. And this means we need to define what a date provider is in this case. So what is the date provider? And we'll build a protocol. Why a protocol? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So we want a date provider protocol that we can use. So this method expects something, any object that conforms to this protocol to be passed into it. And it's going to have one method to give us the current date and time. So that's the only thing that this object, that this protocol's responsibility is, is to provide us with the current date and time, whatever that is. It should know. And for, for this, we're going to need a fake object or a mock object in order to use in our test. So we're going to create in our test uh, target only our fake date provider that implements this protocol. And we need to, to return something from the current date time method that returns a date, right? So we're just going to fill this in with return something. We need to return something. Now, there's a pattern that uh, I've been using for defining these types of return values in fakes and mocks and Swift. And that pattern is using the method name with an underscore or an underbar and then return value. So this is going to return current date time, which is the method name, underbar return value. And this is a uh, local, locally defined variable inside 
our fake date provider, which we can initialize to anything. We'll initialize it just to, to date for now. And this is, this is implemented as a class uh, specifically. We can talk about those details afterwards. Um, but this is implemented as a class, has this current date time return value, which is accessible outside of the fake date provider. And it just returns that when it gets asked for it from the current date time method. We all good so far. All good so far. All right. Okay, back, back to our test. And we're back, back to our test. And we need to pass in our fake into this method call. So we are initializing our fake date provider and we're passing it in to our time remaining until departure method for our test, okay? And the next step is the most important step of this whole process. And that is we need to tell our fake date provider what we want it to return when we ask it for the current time. And this is how we're able to, to test this. So we're gonna tell our fake date provider, hey, your current time right now is going to be set to April 24th, 2017 at 7, 12 p.m. Just let that sink in for a second. So this is whenever we ask our fake for its current date and time, it's gonna give us this value back. That's what it thinks the current time is. And so now we can adjust our expectation to be 24 hours prior. 86,400 is just 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 hours. Give us the number of seconds in a day. Uh, so we're going to test that our departure you know, date is going to be 24 hours after the current, quote unquote, current time, which we have already told it what we want it to be. So with this, our updated test then looks like this. Uh, we just have our trip home. Again, we initialize our fake date provider, tell it what we want its current date time value to be, and then we implement, well, we, uh, we invoke our method, the time remaining until departure, passing in our fake date provider, and now we can make an assertion that says, hey, we expect our remaining time to be equal to this value based on what we, what we sent into it. And so then the question becomes, well, what about the actual implementation? Well, we actually need to, to get the current date and time in our production app. You know, the test is, is great. That's great that we can confirm that. But we want to actually get the current time in our implementation. So the implementation side, again, we start from the protocol, so date provider protocol, and it's going to provide us with the current date and time. And the implementation is really simple, it's just return date. So that's, that's exactly what the current time is. And so this is the first change. The next change that we need to do is we just need to pass in this default date provider into the call site. So for our actual code, this gets updated to look like this. Uh, our trip home is already defined and we call time remaining until departure and we pass in our default date provider as our date provider into the method and we can format our time and print that out and get exactly what we were looking for. And uh, with that, that satisfies our test. That gives us the ability to test this with the, the current date and time. And this also gives us the ability, now that we have this date provider, this fake date provider, this also gives us the ability to test other scenarios. So we may want to know after the flight has departed to you know, no longer show our remaining time, we may want to show like a departed status. We may want to update the status some uh, in another way if it's arrived at its current destination city. Um, you know, there are all sorts of things that we can test now just by pulling this one piece of information outside of the method implementation so that we can control it outside of it. And so um, this is basically the, the whole idea with this. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Um, maybe you've heard the term dependency injection, and that's all that this is, DI. And maybe um, dependency injection is uh, one of those phrases that sounded really 
uh, intense or really overwhelming or you know difficult concept to, to grasp at first but um, this is a really simple example and a really fun way to start getting into dependency injection if you haven't had a chance to work with it yet and uh, I, I hope that this example helps to show you that you know, DI isn't anything to, to be afraid of, and it's really something that uh, is easy to learn and practice, and especially with a, an example like this. So, in summary, um, what we did is we started out by identifying the dependency that was within our method, and you can do this for anything. You know, look at your code and see what the dependencies are. It could be a network request. It could be a database, right? Um, it could be the current date and time. There are all sorts of dependencies that are littered all throughout our code. And it's easy to identify them once you understand where they are, if you need to pull them out to test them. Uh, we created a protocol for this, a very simple protocol, and extracted that piece, that one piece, out of <coughs> our method in, into this provider to provide it to us. Um, we passed in the actual value at runtime, which is really straightforward, just initializing a default version of our uh, protocol, and then created a fake that we could use for testing. And so, of course, we could get into a lot more details with different ways of, of faking and locking things out and different dependencies, but um, I really wanted to keep this simple for this example, providing a date provider, and uh, I hope that this was... Uh, easy and fun for everybody. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Derek Lee Rock or GitHub. And uh, I haven't posted up uh, the code for this yet, but I'm going to share the code for this sample up on uh, GitHub afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, experiences with uh, testing dates, times, dependency injection. Um, there are two ways that I like to use to get the epoch timestamps. One is just, uh, I think it's epochdateconverter.com. Uh, it's a really simple website. And there's also a uh, Mac command line utility that you can use to do some easy translations back and forth between epoch date times and normal date times. Yeah. I saw some people nodding in the audience for like dependency injection and stuff. How many people have been doing DI? Yeah, got a couple testing, yeah, all right. Was this helpful, was this interesting? Was this uh, something new? Have, has anybody seen something like this before? Yes, no, yeah, okay. Yeah, we got a, we got a rowdy audience today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last opportunity for questions, comments. I don't know, is there a good Apple library for dependency injection or do you just do it on yourself? I know I work in my C sharp and they have a lot of mm -hmm. APIs for dependency injection. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I usually did it myself when I was doing iOS and stuff. Is there any libraries that are coming out or do they have any that makes it easier? So there's none that Apple provides that I'm aware of. Um, at Pivotal Labs, I've been doing a lot of work in Swift and in Java, and for on the Java side, we've been using Mockito a lot, um, but actually there's been um, a, kind of a pattern in the office of recently just building our own mocks. And um, you may or may not have seen it, I'm sure if you Google for it, Uncle Bob, uh, Robert Martin, he did a post recently about writing your own mocks and the concept that you know by using a library such as Mockito or at least in the Objective-C world, OC Mock, um, OC Mockito, you know, these libraries and frameworks provide so much and they, they, they literally build out entire objects and fake out entire objects for you and sometimes that can be a lot or too much or there can be side effects from that that you don't expect. So for those reasons I've actually recently started just building all my own mocks you know, um, manually and of course, in Swift, there isn't, there hasn't been too many good um, dependency injection libraries. Uh, I did hear about Swinject. Some people in Pivotal Labs and another office are using Swinject. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. But um, the benefit, I think, of creating your own mocks and fakes is that you get a, a deeper understanding of how they're working. 
And I found that for teaching purposes, it really helps to show building out the fake object yourself manually to, in order to help people who are new to this concept understand it and grasp it a little bit better. And like, like locking libraries tend to have a little a lot of magic behind them. Yeah, um, but Gangos, when I first used the dependency injector a long, long time ago, I thought it was just magic. Mm. And then when I came to Swift and started feeling myself, I was like, oh, it's not that you can do a lot of stuff under the hood, but really, you really want to be the simple ones. Yeah. Off. yeah. Yeah, it's great. Thank you for that question. Cool. All right. Anybody else? Matt tells me he, he counts to 30, I think, when he asks for questions. So people, nobody wants to ask a question in the first five seconds. So. You good for your presentation, Ben? As good as I can be. Okay. All right. One more time. Questions? Yes, sir. All right. Great. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Ben's up next.